ladies and gentlemen. It certainly gives me great pleasure to be here as the hydrographer of Australia and with my background with defence dealing with hydrography, meteorology and oceanography. Certainly to be here with such a distinguished um, group gathering of people but also to basically have a, have a conversation about how we can cooperate in maritime charting. There are many dimensions to maritime charting and tonight I'm just going to concentrate on why we do maritime charting, why we have the need, but also the opportunity for us as very close neighbours, but also with a very strong desire for um, good outcomes in our maritime domain, whether it be efficiency of shipping and protection of our very pristine maritime environments. Um, so thank you again for the invitation tonight. Uh, thank you to Commodore Plath for, for allowing me to be here tonight and, and certainly thank you for being here as well. Uh, sometimes talking about hydrography, you don't get too many people turning up, but thank you very much for coming. The main reason we, um, we undertake hydrography, and that's myself and also my, my counterpart, um, Admiral Harjo, that looks after hydrography for, for, for Indonesia, is the Safety of Life at Sea Convention. So that's the International Convention for Safety of Life at Sea. We have very specific obligations as coastal states, so those that have um, maritime domains, to deliver hydrographic services. So that means that our governments have signed up to the international treaty to make sure that ships can navigate safely in our waters. And it's not a static activity, that there are things always changing. Even when we produced the charts maybe 10 years ago, 20 years ago, the environment changes. Um, certainly in your waters, you've got volcanic activity that changed the seabed. The nature of shipping changes, the ships are getting bigger. Uh, as a society um, all over the world, we want our goods delivered more quickly. So we want the container ships to travel faster. So when we order things over the internet, we want it to turn up within a week. So therefore, our societies expect that those ships will travel quickly, they'll get into our ports efficiently um, and safely, looking after our marine environment, and then the goods will turn up at our door. So we have very specific obligations under the Safety of Life at Sea Convention for delivering very specific hydrographic services. So that's, that's the need. Why, why do we do maritime charting? Uh, this extract here is from the Indonesian chart portfolio. So you can see the extensive coverage that your hydrographer has to cover the very vast Indonesian archipelago. And uh, I can certainly attest from a hydrographer's perspective this is a big challenge. You have obviously many, many islands, many shallow waters, many reefs, lots of, lots of coastline, uh, and you've also got the challenge of international shipping passing through your archipelago. So it's a very big challenge and a very vast one for your navy and for your hydrographer. So I very much feel for Admiral Hajo with the task that he has, actually has, has got. In the Australian context, uh, very similar, but we're obviously slightly different as a, as a large island continent rather than an archipelago, but still very vast coastline, and our charting coverage is, is, is equally, equally large, much like Indonesia. But a challenge that we have got, if you recall the previous, previous diagram, you can see Indonesian charts cover areas of Australia, and similarly, Australian charts cover parts of Indonesia. So here is where some of the cooperation comes in. Instead of each of our countries doing our own thing to meet maritime trade around our own waters, because resources are expensive for governments, so hydrographic officers like mine and uh, one like uh, Pusadrasul, that it's a big challenge to keep the workforce producing charts. So an op there's an opportunity for us to actually cooperate to make sure that we are focusing on the stuff that's really important for our ships and not duplicating effort. And this is one of the reasons why. Um, certainly Indonesia sees these very large ships travelling through um, Malacca Strait and through your archipelago that the ships are getting much larger. Um, society is demanding oil, gas, uh, container ships are getting larger and faster. So you can expect that the challenge on your hydrographer is to deal with being more accurate um, one of my previous jobs with the Australian Maritime Safety Authority was under keel clearance. That's the distance between the keel of these large ships and the seabed. Again, as the ships get larger, that distance gets smaller. So the hydrographers have to survey more accurately 
And then when you put that information on a chart, you have to make sure that the mariner can use that uh, effectively and that any updates uh, you give to the mariner very quickly. So maritime charting is becoming much more complex as we transition from uh, traditional paper charts to electronic charts where the information can be sent to the ships more quickly, updated more quickly, but it's another challenge for us to keep those charts up to date. The other challenge um, is cruise ships. They don't like to go where all the other ships go. They like to go and explore. So they like to go around your archipelago or in Australia, they like to go to very remote parts of Australian waters, sometimes even down to the Antarctic. So again, the challenge for the hydrographer and the maritime charting challenge for each country is to try and deal with the growth in shipping demand in the normal shipping routes, but also where these other ships, which have lots of people on board, so if something nasty happens to the ship, that's a big problem for navies and for search and rescue to go and rescue these people in very remote parts of, of the planet. A challenge for my, um, my charting team is to keep up to date um, with the demands of the shipping companies, whether they be the large bulk carriers or even the cruise ships. They need more information, more accurate information and more detailed information. So half of the challenge is managing the data. The next challenge is turning that into a product. So you can see on the, on the slide up here, I've got a traditional electronic chart, which doesn't have much information based on the current specification. The chart on the right-hand side of the, of the screen shows the more detail that we are now starting to put into those charts so that the mariners can now make very informed decisions about how much water is underneath the ship, which means your port state control, your harbour masters and your navy can be assured that the ship is navigating safely. But it becomes a challenge because I'm now producing paper charts and electronic charts and the International Hydrographic Organisation is changing a new standard uh, based on a new specification called S100 for a new standard of electronic chart. So potentially we're producing three types of charts for the mariners to use, which becomes a big challenge for managing the data and keeping it up to date. But the reality is that no matter what we do, no matter what your navies do to look after ships, mariners will do very silly things. Um, they do things in 1910 and they'll do things in 2012. Uh, you probably recall the one in 2012 being the Costa Concordia. So no matter how much hard work the Italian hydrographer put into their charts, the mariner will still do silly things. Um, and that becomes a challenge for regulating and maritime charting and putting zones on your charts that tell the mariners where you want them to go to make sure that they keep out of your pristine waters and to make sure that they stick into areas where you actually want them to go. But again, no matter what you do, people and mariners will still do silly things. But how do we get around when all of these challenges in the maritime space? One of the big, big um, solutions is cooperation. Uh, the International Hydrographic Organisation is, a, is an international or intergovernmental body that allows coastal states like ours to cooperate, to share ideas, to help build capacity together, but also help build capacity of other states in our region, in our case, to help them be better at doing hydrography and for making charts. Uh, Australia is a long-standing member of the International Hydrographic Organisation and so is Indonesia. Um, and it was certainly very pleasing that Indonesia, through the International Hydrographic Organisation Council uh, voting process, uh, was elected to the council. Uh, the council will sit in Monaco next week um, and hopefully my counterpart from Indonesia will be there as well. Um, the East Asia area is very well represented uh, through the IHO council. Um, so conversations that we have about how to share these problems, how to develop technology together, and how to understand the future of what the maritime community is after are good points for discussion at the IHO. Many of the problems um, that come our way are through our sister organisation, the International Maritime Organisation, which represents the ships. Um, so those are the customers of the products that we make. 
to give you an idea about the International Hydrographic Organisation and some subordinate bodies within the, within the organisation, on the screen you'll see uh, a graphic that shows the regional hydrographic commissions. So the three that are, are, are worth highlighting to you are the East Asia Hydrographic Commission. Uh, Indonesia is a, a long-standing member of that commission. Um, they are also, as of July this year, uh, from a meeting in Cairo, Indonesia is also now a member of the North Indian Ocean Hydrographic Commission. So you can see on the graphic there, it's just to the, to the west of Indonesia. Um, and discussions with my um, Indonesian uh, counterpart, he would also like for Indonesia to become a member of the South West Pacific Hydrographic Commission. So if you look at the, the, the area surrounding Indonesia, there are three hydrographic commissions in which Indonesia uh, can share its knowledge, its expertise, and help other, other countries grow in their knowledge of, of how to make charts, how to conduct surveys, but importantly, as a very large um, and influential archipelagic state, there's a lot of information and advice that can be given to other countries like Papua New Guinea, uh, Solomon Islands, as, as slightly smaller archipelagic states, but the challenges that Indonesia has got with lots of shipping, they can pass that advice to other states on how to manage the expectations of shipping um, and the IMO as, as an archipelagic state. Now, I mentioned the, the International Maritime Organisation. Uh, this year, the theme for World Maritime Day, which was on the, celebrated at the IMO on the 28th of September, so just a couple of weeks ago, it's connecting ships, ports and people. And I've got on the slide there the, um, the text from the IMO website, which gives you some insights as to what that really means. Um, so I'll just give you a chance to read that. But you can see that the main thrust is about what do ships do and from a maritime charting perspective, how does maritime charting help the IMO to achieve what they're trying to achieve and how do we connect those ships, ports and people? So it's through maritime strategies, your recently re released uh, oceans uh, policy. Um, all of these aspects help join together many government departments in thinking maritime. Um, Australia is a very large maritime country, but many Australians, they stand at the beach, but they look into the land. They don't look out to the sea. Um, so even though we say in our national anthem that we are girt by sea, not many Australians think about the sea. Um, so we have a strategy of trying to get Australians to understand what is maritime. Now the, the next, next slide, I've got information from a, a recent um, study, so it was in 2012, that the Asian Development Bank funded a study through the Japan um, Fund for Poverty Reduction, where they did a study into Papua New Guinea, again as an archipelagic state with communities all around the islands. How do they make sure that they can all stay connected? Again, back to the IMO theme, connecting ships, ports and people. Many of their maritime provinces and many of their larger urban cities like uh, Port Moresby, Leh, Wewak, Madang, Alatau, many of the families will move to those, those urban centres and they become disconnected from their families. And, they, and the families at home in the, the, the coastal provinces, they are disconnected from health services, education. So the strategy from the Asian Development Bank is to use the ships and use the Asian Development Bank fund to improve that connectivity, to make sure that they are joining the people with, with the communities. Um, and the important message there is that it's not about the ships themselves, it's about what the ships actually do. Um, so it's very important for an archipelagic state that when you're coming up with strategies, yes, the outcome should be that, as it says on the slide there at the bottom, that ships will benefit, they'll be able to move freely through your archipelago, or your, or your domestic shipping will be able to move in the archipelago, but the ships aren't the outcome. It's what the ships actually do to link up your society and bring your people together. Um, and that was the outcome of the Asian Development Bank um, study. Australia has a similar issue. We've got many, many remote communities across northern Australia. We are trying to use hydrography and maritime strategies to link those many remote communities through ship services because we still don't have the road and rail um, linkages in northern Australia. So ships are the way we need to do that business.
Terima kasih. Thank you.